why he is such an iconic character and of all the great characters that genre has given us he's one that seems to speak to people who aren't necessarily even normally huge fans of the genre yeah well it's a good film first of all it's uh uh, we have the music of Philip Glass. We have the cinematography of Tony Richmond, who did The Man for Earth. We have Bernard Rose. I mean, you got Virginia Madsen, who's an incredible leading lady. Uh, it's just, it's just, it's iconic because it captures the particular side of Chicago before the fall of Green and Green. Green and Green is no longer standing. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's a personal hieroglyphic. That's left an imprint, in the, minds imprint in the minds of people uh, that, I'm of. that I'm proud of. But I, I, but I, I yes, the conversation yes, always returns to Candyman. Candyman. I'm, I'm, proud I'm proud of him. Do I want that, to, I want be that to be the only thing that people remember? Not at all. Not at all. Um, um, it's part, part of a package. And, uh, and uh, you know, it's been, been good to me. But he's, but he's not the only thing that I am. What's going on, everybody? Um, I want to thank y'all so much for tuning in to this wonderful, wonderful Friday. Um, definitely sorry about the technical difficulties we had just a little bit. It is raining very hard in our area, but we're able to get this thing going, and we are glad that y'all are in the building. So if you are in the building, make sure you are sharing this video with your friends. Let everybody know where you're at because you can be doing everything on a Friday. Um, not really everything on a Friday because some places are still shut down because of coronavirus, but you are here. You're taking the time to spend time with us here in the wonderful world of the virtual world. And you guys are here for Art the Heart. So Art the Heart, the reason this show began is if you guys are familiar, I do a show here in Fayetteville known as Art Meets Life. And with Art Meets Life, what we normally do is we have an open mic that normally goes on during the night. But then at a certain portion of the night, we, we always feature. And with the feature... We normally do a Q and A with the feature. We get to know a lot about the, the artists themselves as people because you get to know the artists based on music they make, poems they recite, um, movies they may have played in, or anything like that. But you get to know them for those roles, but you do not get to know them as the people they are. So what I wanted to do was I wanted to take that particular aspect of Art Meets Life, strip it down, and we literally just bring a feature up here. And all we do is get to know the artist. So it's not going to be nobody up here reciting any poems. It's not going to be nobody up here doing any monologues or anything of that nature. This show is literally just going to be a good one-on-one -on -one conversation with everybody um, that we bring up here. And by all means, if you're in a, if you're watching this video right now, by all means, share it. And then feel free to ask questions um, along with myself because we will post those questions up here for everybody to see. Um, quick few clean um, house cleaning rules. Number one. Make sure you respect the artist. And when I mean respect the artist, please do not get up here asking crazy questions. What I mean by crazy questions is what's your phone number so I can call you and stuff like that because we do not want that happening up here. But you can ask questions and we do want you to post your questions within our comments section because during the duration of the show, aside from myself asking questions and having a conversation with our feature, um, you get to ask questions too and we bring them up on the screen so that way you guys get to um, interact with this and you can ask the feature questions himself. So other than that, it's going to be a fun time. Um, the show is going to probably run about an hour, maybe more. It just depends on what happens, but we're about to go ahead and get this thing started. So with that being said, um, I'm going to get into the story a little bit later of how we met, but um, I'm very honored and privileged to have this particular artist be our first feature for this wonderful show known as Art the, um, Art the Heart. So it's, it's so many things that he's done in the acting career, in the um, entertainment business. And a lot of people know him for his role as Candyman. A lot of people know him for um, his role that he played in Final Destination. But the man has a plethora of work, like a good long list of great, 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 great body of work. And we're going to get to talk about that today. We're going to get to um, ask some other questions as well. And we're going to have fun with it. So by all means, I want everybody, if you can, I want you to please put your hands together for the one the only Mr. 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 Tony Todd. Tony Todd, how are you doing, brother? How are you doing? I'm out here in Fayetteville, man. How are you doing today, Mr. Bowen? I'm doing good. good. I'm doing good, brother. I'm, I'm very, 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 very happy to have you here on this show. I know you are a busy man. I, I know for a fact you're a busy man, but I am definitely thankful that you are here spending time with us. Already, um, the comments section is is going nuts right now giving right. you um some high fives and pounds 
this is my corn <laughs> berry that I've been growing since day one, and I'm not going to shave it off until the next time I appear on set, unless I grow two pounds of it, of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, just, since we're talking about that, this is my corn, my quarantine fro. Hey, you you see like, I wish you could grow one too, man. Speaking of that, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I am definitely oh, dealing with this. I no. I saw the tomato glow and it looked like sun flow, but then it tasted like vinegar, vinaigrette running down my cheeks and the veins of my heart because I couldn't get started with art this time. I ain't mean, art in my life like we all do. Stop clowning like fools, spitting on the beach and act like sensible people not out of reach. That's all I gotta say. Just so you good? You good? <laughs> I'm snapping. <laughs> oh, I always wanted so. to be a Man. But you know what? We're we're gonna get into a whole bunch of stuff. So once again, because we got people that's tuning in right now, by all means, for everybody that's in the comment section that's watching this video right now, if yeah. you have questions you would love to ask Tony Todd, please put them in the comment section. We will bring them up to the screen so he can answer. Um, by all means, do not feel shy. But um I don't do many of these interviews lately, in case you haven't noticed, because a certain movie wants me to hold off to September for all the studio sent and shit. But I did this because this man here is a good friend of mine from Apple Pan to Fayetteville. Okay? Definitely. Nice. Oh, man. We got it. So we, we definitely got to set that up. Um, But there's a whole bunch of stuff we can talk about. So this is what we're going to do. So we're going to kick this off. I'm going to ask you a couple of fun questions before we get into some serious questions. Um. Even though you already set the tone already, but we're going to go ahead and just ask some fun questions. So I'm let's go ahead listen and listen. The first rule of acting, all you people out there, is how to learn how to listen. You can't respond until you hear the content and the tone of what's being said to you. Okay. And then you can decide for yourself whether it's truth, fact, or fiction. I love that. You know, I got a poll call fact. I'm going to send it to you later. Oh, <laughs> oh, that, man. Do it. This is what this I mean, is for. All right. All right. Let's go. So, first question, fun question. Yeah. What is your favorite word and why? Uh, uh, profane or decent? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, when I was a kid, I made up a word uh, called uh, uh, what was it called? Super, super delicious. Super delicious. And I used to joke around with the boys, you know, we'd be in the garage practicing our whole doo-wop thing because everybody thought they were going to be David Ruffin or Eddie Kay. And uh, mm -hmm. I learned very early that I can't sing. But as you know, and most of the fans know, I love music deeply and I love all my out of work musicians, particularly the brothers in Chicago who were operating and living on $100 per gig, three day gigs a night and had no savings. And all of a sudden they're being forfeited out of not just their income, but of our love of music, okay? Shout out to the Kings and Minds, Frank Pellegrino, I love you to death, stay strong. And shout out to all the jazz musicians in New York that don't have an audience to play in, okay? So while we're worrying about whether we can hang out on beaches, there are actual people that are missing their livelihood because of our continued actions. That's the only soapbox I'm gonna get on, but come on, everybody, let's stay safe, and let's get out of this together and get on the other side and rock and roll, okay? I like my watermelon with salt on it, just like everybody else does. <laughs> nice, nice. So, next question: What is your least favorite word and why? Uh, nigga, 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 nigga. Yeah, I rarely get that said to my face. <laughs> that's 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 self-explanatory right there. Okay. <laughs> we well, gotta I, go I hate it when we we use the word too because we gotten way too comfortable with it. And certain people, you know, would listen to rap music and say, well, they're saying it, you know, why can't I co-op? Because you can't, because you don't walk the walk and you don't live the life. You didn't grow up in the hood, the projects, the streets, had to work your way through college because you were test scorers, had to be better than anybody else in order to get a scholarship. They told you you either had to play football, basketball, or learn how to sing and dance, okay? Or maybe politics. <laughs> I'm loving this already. So I, this this is this this is going so many ways. Like I'm trying to get the professional question out the way before we actually just sit and talk. About this talk. So we, <laughs> so Clint, <laughs> knowing everything that you do, all the jobs that you have, what profession besides your own would you like to have tried or attempt, and why? Well, the most rewarding job I ever had in my 
30 years of show business. When I got my master's in theater, I moved back to my hometown of Harvard, Connecticut. Um, and I started a, a, a teenage theater troupe called Free Me Truth Troop. I wanted to not only give back to my hometown, but I wanted to practice the things I had been taught for the last seven years. And uh, I approached the mayor at the time, and I approached uh, my former high school, Harvard High School, and I said, give me your worst. He said, do you want our brightest? No, I said, give me your worst. And they came up with a list of maybe 25 kids that were they called disenfranchised, inattentive, non-responsive, and so forth. And I had them five days a week from uh, 4 o'clock to 8 o'clock every night, and nobody ever missed a session. And we, at the end of the two-year run, we actually got a commendation from the mayor of Hartford. So that was the most rewarding time. I think I was making, I don't know, 300 a week. But it didn't matter because the love and appreciation I got from the students on a one-to-one -one basis as they absorbed and realized that it could be better than what the world was telling them they could be or should be meant more than bags of gold. I love it. I love it. Um, so last question, um, last little fun question. Um, if you had your choice between a fried bologna sandwich or a ham and cheese sandwich, which would you go to and why? Well, I haven't ate pork uh, since my college days, my political polit political theater times. Uh, it was just, I read this book called Sugar Blues and I said, I'll never, I'll never, never eat that. And, and it's right. a habit that I've stayed true to. And unless it's a Hebrew national bologna, which is kosher beef bologna, then I would have to say the fried bologna sandwich, which as a kid, trust me, I had plenty of. <laughs> nice. I had a whole heap so of too. <laughs> Man. He, said he would grab the hot sauce, wouldn't let nobody take it. We'll give a little tenor out of it. So, can I have some hot sauce? No. <laughs> you know, bones out here, you're like. <laughs> Neck bones. You know, you know, you know. I feel like I feel like out of all interviews I've done uh, for anybody, you you're like one of the funnest ones right now because you're literally having fun with it. From the ones I've seen you do, and to this one, I think it's because we're family. We can have fun with it, so that's what I love so much about it. Um, so, and, and so people, let's. You know, the, the Hollywood doesn't realize that actually I have a very funny side. I have a very comedic nature. I laugh a lot. Richard Pryor is my hero. And, uh, you know, and uh, a friend of mine, Stan Shaw, once told me, he says, Tony, you know, everybody that gets made in Hollywood, particularly if you're African-American, if you come in playing a certain color, whether it be yellow, blue, red, green, whatever it is, in my case, let's say it's yellow, okay? They're going to try to make you continue to play that yellow. They're not interested in trying to expand the instrument. I'm a full orchestra, and I'm not bragging, but I know what I've been through. I know what I've seen. I know what I've encountered. I know my training. I know what's out there. And I am sympathy. Symphony. Nice. So you, so I had a question, but I'm back. You actually just brought up a good point um, for something I wanted to ask. Um, I think I'm drinking my scotch too early because I will be doing that after the show because I got a little uh, PS4 NFL Madden to go back to when in my 15 Super Bowl straight. But this is tea. It's black organic black tea. Of course, it's black. <laughs> black, black honey in it. <laughs> so. <laughs> Um, I'm gonna bring up something. I'm gonna bring up something real quick because um it's funny because my, my wife my wife just actually joined in on it just a second ago and we was actually having a conversation um earlier just talking about a lot of the stuff that we all we've all done together but this this question came up and I really want to pose it on here because of something you just hinted to so being the person that you are now with everything you've done what is one of the biggest misconceptions people give you when they first meet you or see you what's like the biggest thing they think about you before even talking to you and seeing that funny side of Tony Todd. Uh, that I was deliberately released by their parents and scared them to death when they were five to nine years old. Like I was in cahoots with their parents to just frighten them forever in a very uh, ethereal, mystical, romantic way, but still frightened to the bone. But you know, that's it was a horror, came in, it was a horror movie, so that was the intention. 
Yeah, but it seems it seems like his parents do that a lot. Um, they put it on, they put that um perspective on it. Like, yeah, so if you meet this guy, then this this how he is. But like, of course, and now I can get to the story how we first met, and um, everybody can hear this. So it's crazy because it's gonna lead to the next question. So the way me and Tony first met, it literally I was just now starting on the scene doing a lot of nerd slams that we've always talked about, I always tell you about, and when Raleigh Supercon first came to North Carolina. Right. I saw that you were going to be on it. And the first thing I, was, I told my wife was like, I got to meet Tony Todd. I had a lot of people. I got to meet Tony Todd. But one of the dopest things about the whole interaction was when I reached out to you, you reached back out. And I know for me, that was a big thing um, because um, I've met a few people before um, as far as celebrities, but some people left a bad impression because of the big head syndrome. But you've always been like one of the nicest people I've met. And you've always been... 100% Tony, nothing's changed about you. This is how you are, this is how you are. So with that being said, um, what made you, what makes you that, that that type of person or that type of celebrity that not um, not only gives back to people, but just see the goodness in people and in some way, shape or form want to stay connected? Well, I think it's a shame for anybody that's given any kind of celebrity to turn their back on anybody that's trying to come up the same path. But that person's obviously climbed already. Um, you know, I was raised an only kid. I was raised by my aunt Clara, lovely woman, from the age of three on, and uh, she taught me how to be sensitive to other people. Um, you know, and to respect people, no matter who they were, where they came from, what they did for a profession. Everybody had an essential thing that they offered to the rest of society. And as a former teacher, I just want to. I want to encourage people. I don't want to destroy them and tear it down because I know I know my own path. And the one thing my aunt did for me was she taught me to always believe in myself and to never take no for an answer and to know going into it that I had to be a hundred times better than the next guy in order to even get a, 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 a toenail hole. So I just, you know, I love people and I love artists and I love the creative community. And, uh, Unless you're doing a one-man theater show, there's no way that you can do any entertainment job without the assistance of other people. And we're also doing it for an audience that is appreciative of our work. So why be an asshole in life? It's very disappointing for the fan base. Definitely. And, and speaking of um, the path that you said you came on, um, enlighten us a little bit of like your your early upbringing. Like what what was it that got you into wanting to do theater? Um, I have a very flamboyant family. I have some wonderful uncles, Uncle Zach, um, Uncle Edward, who was an undercover cop in New York City. Uncle Zach was a kind of a waste about, but very colorful, very flamboyant. Uncle Joe, who used to draw paintings downtown Highford, mystery places before graffiti even came into existence, and then come home and tell us stories about how the monsters always wanted to chase him. So I had that. I had some... Uh, you know, I had good friends in the neighborhood. We played street ball, man. When we were at 9, 11, and the cars would come, we said, hold on, watch out for the car. Just hold it up. Don't tackle me on the asphalt, man. Well, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> the joy of sport and backyard barbecues, which I know this weekend people are feeling like they're missing that. And I'm sure you can do it in your, your own privacy of your backyard because it is Memorial Day weekend. But let's remember... Royal Day weekend is a tribute to soldiers that have fought for our freedom. Okay. Yes. Whatever that means to you individually. But it's not necessarily, I know we all were raised to believe that it was the unofficial beginning of summer. And uh, as a kid, that was great because it meant being out of school. But right now, because I've been out of school for almost three months. That's true. That's definitely true. I'm glad you actually brought that up as far as. Um with the, the vets and um, Memorial Day, because a lot of people do take that for granted. Because like, like matter of fact, we just had a lot of people probably leave North Carolina because North Carolina went into phase two and a lot of people going to South Carolina because South Carolina's open. So it's Black Bike Week. So we know a lot of people are more so traveling there just to get out and about and be free as to just, you know, pay respect I, to the vets. I, I, I've been locked up just like everybody else has been locked up. But every time I go out, it's for essential services. I put on my custom made, uh, you know, coronavirus mask and I go get my groceries and I get my scotch and I come home. Um, and I know the impulse, but, you know, freedom is relative. You know, when they, we came over on the Amistad and other ships, 
there was no time limit to where we were going to not only get off if we made it, but then get off and go right to work for free. So Definitely. it's all relative. So um, I'm going to go ahead and start leaning towards um, a certain thing. So um, I know you talked about your upbringings with um, how you came up. So I want to get into acting. Can you tell us a little bit about more um, thing. Your time? I, I also oh, yeah. grew up like surrounded by projects, housing projects, W Square, Stoll Village, et cetera. And all of them had their own gangs. So I was, uh, you know, I, I had a growth spurt and I remember getting jumped by the gang once accidentally because I was visiting a friend over in the projects and he had had a little bit too much beer to drink. And I thought they were just blaming him for something. Next thing you know, I'll end up on my back. That was the last ass kicking I ever had. Um, you know, so I had to learn. I, I didn't. I knew I didn't want to be a member of a gang because I didn't have a low self esteem. I knew that I didn't. What I needed to do wasn't dependent on a group of people to agree with me. You know, and I didn't have criminal tendencies at that time. You know, I didn't feel like robbing, stealing a car, or breaking into somebody's house, or beating somebody up just for the hell of it. My idea of fun was every Friday night going to the local graveyard, which surrounded my neighborhood, and waiting for the drunks or the pimps to walk down the street and do our little joke laughs, you know. <laughs> that may have been the beginning of my life. <laughs> and so one time a pimp in a pink Cadillac he stopped that car and he began to chase us. We had we threw some eggs at the back of his uh you know the, the tire keeper in the back and he actually jumped that fence and tried to catch us young boys but we managed to get away. Nobody tripped and slipped. <laughs> nice. You you just answered like so now I'm starting to see a lot of what you just said stand out in some other roles you played. And we're going to get to that. But what I'm going to do real quick is I'm going to take myself off the screen for a quick second. I'm going to keep you on there. You'll still be able to hear me, but I'm going to bring up some questions from the people in the comments section that um, wanted to give you some questions. OK, let's go. All right. So with that being said, uh, Mr. Tony Todd, your first question, get ready to come up as soon as my screen stops acting up is this one, which is, what advice would you provide to someone who wants to get into the acting industry? I uh, love it with all your heart because it's a very competitive business. And uh, as a beautiful acting teacher once said to us in a class, uh, look in front of you, look to the left, look to the right, look behind you, look around the room, okay? Out of the 30 of you, maybe one of you has a shot. So knowing that, you have to be absolutely prepared. Read every great book you can on acting. Watch all your favorite movies. Find out who you are because you can't act unless you know or have an extreme amount of not ego, but self-confidence and just trust. The best book thing that I've ever read is the first six lessons. People that know me know I always recommend that book. Bolesowski, first six lessons. It will change your life. All right. And we got one more question, which actually was going to go into something I was going to bring up earlier, but we can go ahead and like use this as a segue. Um, this next question is, what's your favorite role ever? Um, well, I come from the theater uh, and I've had I've had great times in the theater. You know, uh, Apple Fugard is a South African playwright, uh, was one of our teachers at Trinity Rep. 20 years later, I got to be on stage with the premiere of one of his plays called The Captain's Tiger. We opened at La Jolla Playhouse, went to Manhattan Theater Club, and ended up at Kennedy Center in D.C., where I got nominated for the Helen Hayes Award. That was one. The second was working with August Wilson when he was alive. And uh, Max Wilch was our musical director. Marion McClinton, uh, the wonderful Ella Joyce, played my wife, Tanya, in the uh, original production of King Hedley II, which I originated. Um, three and a half hour production. We premiered it at the Pittsburgh Public Theater. And I got the best fan letter I ever got from somebody who was in the audience who said, that character was based on my experiences and my life and my shortcomings. And I felt during those three and a half hours, I was watching a mirror image of myself. So somehow you got to the truth. So those are what makes those favorite. Now I know the movies are the things that the audience sees the most of. Um, and I love movies and I love TV, but, uh, theater is my, uh, my beloved treasure. I, I think you answered that the way you needed to, because like you said, and that's why we're doing this, because like you said, a lot of people know you for movies, but a lot of people don't know that theater side of you. 
So um, what was the, so based on that, what was the first, go ahead. Here's what I'm missing right now. Like I would, if not, if the pandemic hadn't happened, I would have been in, uh, in uh, Central Valley, Pennsylvania right now, starting rehearsals for Fences, another August Wilson play. Um, uh, and that was the first thing that got canceled early on. I was depressed for maybe a week because I'd already started working on it for two months. And ever since they told me it was canceled, the book is still here on the coffee table, but I haven't been able to open it because it's too painful to be able to read words that you just want to express to an audience of 500 to 1,000 people. Got you, got you. Yeah, so, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't cut you off. Yeah. So we'll see. Got you. So speaking of theater, can you tell us a little bit about um, the time, I guess, I guess basically you tell us about how your characters and everything got made as far as like what got you like wanting to act as far as the people you were around, but what mm -hmm. was it that got you into theater? And then the segue to that would be what was the first role you got when it came to going to either the small screen or the big screen? Okay, another part of my upbringing, my aunt was smart enough and an astute woman that every summer she put me into a different program, whether it was uh, geology class or uh, uh, learning about architecture. She just made sure that my mind was always tested. And ultimately I, I became a Boy Scout member for a long time. I became a, a life scout, which is, was one merit badge short of being an ego. And um, I, through that experience, I was able to go to Japan, Tokyo, Japan, for the Will J. Marie in 72, actually, and uh, change my life. It was my first time on a plane, first time being exposed to another culture. And the scoutmaster, who was also a minister, he saw something in me and he said, I want to write a speech for you to give you, uh, to make a public speaking thing. And he wrote it, and I remember it was at the Edmund Insurance Company. There was a thousand people there, and I read his beautiful words, and there wasn't a dry eye in the place. And I said, wow, I had never received kind of love before. And uh, at the same time, an English teacher in high school, Mrs. Reynolds, gave me a copy of The Tempest because uh, I was like sports child because I had that growth spurt, and I couldn't navigate walking down the hallway or the stairs or the steps about ever tripping. <laughs> I guess that's why the gangs just shook their heads. There ain't no, we don't need to Bible with him. Leave him alone. I think he's a little touched. Okay. God bless all those gang members who are no longer alive today. Mm, got you. So, um, you've been in a lot of roles, and this I'm gonna I'm gonna bring up something, and then I'm gonna go to another question that um. You get so about a few flops. Say that again. I said, and a few flops. You can't have a bunch of hits about a few flops. Oh, by all means, by all means. You mean you gotta? It, it happens. It happens to the best of us. I mean, I'm not even worried about that. But you've been in a, a few movies. Um, some roles stand out a little bit. Say, more. I can always remember the roles that don't work. Okay, because you put, you know, there's no. You, if you're really a sincere actor, you pour your everything into each situation. So, I'll oh yeah, no, and, and that's why I'm glad you didn't work. <laughs> And that's why I'm glad you brought that up because, um, for instance, the movie The Rock, the character that you played in the movie The Rock, like I love the way you made that character. The only thing I hated about that character is Nick Nick Cage is walking right in front of the rock and get ready to shoot it, and you stand right in, and they made your character stand right in front of it like he ain't know what was about to happen. And I didn't like you know, that. Oh, uh, you know, I think Richard Pryor <laughs> that little knife fight. You know, in movies knife fights are always. Da -da 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 no, I would have been Mel Avenue. He would have gutted in a second and I left him at the oh, Yeah, by all means. But it just, it, just seemed, <laughs> it just seemed like they were setting it up in your character, and it made your character like he didn't know what was going on. But you oh, had a he was a little crazy, you know. He was a, he was obsessed by ego. So he was, it was a temporary moment of insanity that gave but, Nick Cage a, a, a jump up on the situation. But then but then you had a role and it was it was a small role, but to me I remembered it because of the way you brought the character, even if it was only like for like five minutes. Um the the bouncer or the bodyguard in a uh, wishmaster. Oh yeah. Johnny yeah, and the way it, yeah, what's what's the name again? Johnny Valentine. Yeah, Johnny Valentine. The way you said that name did the snap like that, like <laughs> that stood out to me tremendously <laughs> because like you you were a type of person um to me when you take a role or a character. You try to find ways to bring it, even if it's for a second, you bring that character to life the way you feel it needs to be regardless of what they tell you. So 
a question that came up from one of the audience members was, and that's why I wanted to bring that up, was what do you love most about the psychology of the characters you dive into? Uh, well, uh, having grown up in the ghetto and educated in the mainland and traveled all the world, I find that the human condition is basically the same everywhere. We're just all different ages and different complexions. Uh, so I just try to, uh, when I read a script, I look, I look for the hook in a character, no pun intended, and I look for the drive and what their super objective is, what is it they want the most, and then you add in what is their point of view towards life. Like if you use Muhammad Ali as an example, he used to say his point of view constantly, I am the greatest, and he lived up to that moment, each and every moment. So you just have to parlay all that together like it's an internal painting. And hopefully you end up with a masterpiece as opposed to a, a dripping watercolor. Got you. Another question we had from the audience was, who do you look up to for inspiration to do what you do? Uh, Lloyd Richards, who was the original director of uh, Raisin in the Sun and who directed August Wilson's first three plays. And when I was a student at the G. O'Neill Theater Center, he was one of our master acting classes. I remember preparing a scene from him from Golden Boy, which is a classic acting scene thing. And he let me get out, I think maybe 30 seconds. And he stopped me and he proceeded for the next three hours to explain to the class what I was doing wrong. Uh, because it was, it was, uh, he, he was, uh, he was stressing for simplicity and honesty and truth. And after the class, I was so dejected and I was just picking up my bags. I'm getting ready to walk out. And he approached me and he says, let's take a walk. We were on the edge of a lake facing Groton. And he told me, he says, you know why I picked on you? Because you got something and I don't want you to ruin it. I don't want to embellish it. I don't want you to force it. I want you to just let it happen moment to moment. And that was my first acting life lesson. That That's good. You, you, you reminded me of back when I was in high school, which is funny because we're, com we're coming up on our 20 year anniversary, like in a couple of weeks. So um, it reminds me of my, my choir teacher, because my choir teacher, when I first got there, um, I, he, he saw something in me, but I was joking around. And it wasn't until right at the end of the school year, where he put up the list for everybody that made choir going into like the next year who made concert choir and everything of that nature. And I wasn't on the list. And then I reached out to him and asked him why I wasn't on the list. And he literally told me that. So then I had to beg and plead with him to be on there. And he literally told me, he was like, I was going to put you back on here anyway, but I just needed to let you know that if you're going to stay on the path that you're on, then you're not going to, he's like, you're going to not be in his class. And he said, I could tell you like the arts, but you may, but something may happen if you leave this particular thing, which I've always been indebted to him because I've actually ended up appreciating the arts more because he kept me in there when he could have literally kept me off of even being in choir. So I'm glad you, I'm actually mm -hmm. glad you brought that up. So, well, he cared but, about you, obviously. Saw uh, yeah. talent in you, wanted you to respect it. Yeah, definitely. And I, like, I'm, I'm, thank, I'm thankful for him to this day. Two, two, two other inspirational black actors who are kind of forgotten. Uh, Oscar Michel, uh, who was one of the first black filmmaker in this country. It was his own uh, production. I once, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> I did a play about him uh, in New York in my early days and unfortunately didn't go further, but a magnificent character. And another actor that doesn't get enough acclaim is James Edwards, who came just before Sidney Poitier. And, and he was going to be the one that they were going to tap to be the first African-American star. You know, he's been in things like uh, The Setup and uh, uh, The Steel Helmet and, um, you know, Dr. Strangelove. He's, he's had his credits, but he had an affair with uh, James Mansfield. This is like 1958. And certain people in Hollywood said, we can't have that. And... Uh, Somehow he got involved in a car accident, and uh, mm. you know, and there went that dream. Wow, man, yeah. definitely. Thanks, thanks for sharing those names too. I know, um, I had somebody you had mentioned a book about a book you read earlier. Somebody had wrote um on one of the other pages that I'm monitoring. What was the name of the book you had mentioned earlier? Because they was gonna look it up. I can't remember the first um, the first six lessons by Boleslavsky. The first six lessons. Got you. Yeah. So. 
like 10 bucks, 12 bucks. So Tony Todd, you started a lot of movies. You started a lot of TV shows. And I, I feel that, and somebody mentioned it earlier and I'm glad I'm bringing this up. So you've been in so many roles and like some people don't even recognize the roles you've been in. Like um, some people know about Platoon. I'll get into all of the main movies that everybody know about. But one movie that stands out the most for a lot of people um, was the fact that you've always, people always seen you in certain roles as more of a secondary character, but you actually had the chance to play um, the lead role. And in that role you played, you were playing the lead role in um, Not a Living Dead. Could you tell us about that experience when you played um, the lead role in Not a Living Dead, the remake? Uh, yeah, it was a great time. Great cast, Bill Mosley, uh, Tolman, William Butler, um, the late Tom Tolles, who's, uh, if he didn't do Harry the way he did it, uh, uh, did it I wouldn't have been then. Um, I, my son was born at the time, Alex, and uh, I was shooting a film in Pittsburgh with Boris Whitaker called Criminal Justice, one of the first TV movies to direct for HBO. And uh, it was forced. He told me about it. Uh, we did. We had done platoon together, so we were fairly close. And he says, "Man, you know, you you look like you're from Dwayne Jones's tribe. You need to go there." And it was Saturday, my day off, and I ran to the production office. I actually cornered Tom Zanini, the director, and uh, he sort of saying, "No, no, I think I got it. I think it's all done." And I've never done that before in my life, but I I didn't manhandle the man. I just kind of grabbed him by his shoulders. And I sat him down and I proceeded to do a monologue as Ben. And uh, I finished. I said, I'm sorry, forgive me. He was silent. I was silent. That was a Saturday. Monday, I had the offer, which is great. And that was my first lead role. So I'll never forget it. Nice. So I've had this weird, I had this question. I can ask you this because um, you're you're a horror buff, um, but you're a movie buff and an acting buff. And I'm awesome. I mean, uh, horror is, is part of the movies I love, but I'm not exclusively a horror. But I'm, that's why I said a movie buff. That's why I said just movie I in general. A point, all the horror fans out there, but I love cinema. I mm -hmm. love and, that, and that's why I'm glad you brought that up. But I want to talk about this particular movie. And the reason being me and a friend was having a talk about it. And I just want to know your thoughts on it. Do you feel that George Romero in this particular movie, um, a lot of people, especially the way it ends um, with The Last Soul Survivor um, in some way, shape, or form, I'm going to talk about the, in the original order remake, but what ends up happening to Ben, do you feel that with George Romero and the way he did this particular movie, do you feel it was more so social conscious or he's trying to make a, like, a social statement to something oh. more than being poor? I asked George about that, okay? And he, he explained to me that the role wasn't written African-American, which is why he actually is allowed to talk so much, okay? And uh, <laughs> Dwayne Jones just happened to be the best actor that uh, auditioned for it. Now, ultimately, it did become a social conscious statement, and I'm and I'm glad for that because, you know, the zombie films became a major, a major uh, vehicle for a lot of Terry Alexander, you know, a lot of us. Um, Ken Faree, you know, a lot of us. And uh, we were able to maybe stand on the soldiers, shoulders, shoulders of social consciousness. Um, you know, I know a lot of people wanted that role, Ben. And, uh, you know, every role is written with one person's DNA all over it. And I'm glad that my slots came up at the right time. So before I go to the next question, it's, it's, it's funny how you keep going to these segues. Somebody just asked this question. What do you do? What do you do to let go of a character after portraying them? OK, it depends on the depth and the emotion that has been invested in that character. For example, when I did The Visitor on Deep Space Nine, Star Trek, uh, the woman that raised me, my aunt, had passed away. And I was completely inconsolable for a couple months. And that script, like, uh, uh, envelope from heaven arrived in my mailbox and I wanted to go into that honoring her and trying to mimic her movements and her gentleness and her, her her strength and the love of an angel and hopefully we accomplish that the hardest role well the, to, the hardest role to let go of was when I originally did Fences at, uh, at G mm. Center because Tori Maxson is an incredible man, you know, former baseball star that never got a shot, working currently as a 
garbage man. His marriage is crumbling, falling apart. Uh, we used to use Sam Cooke, the last mile of the way is his exit music. Um, it took me four months to let go of that character. Every night at seven o'clock, and I would I'd come back to LA. I, I felt like I, I was supposed to be somewhere. But when when you have a when you're honored, and those of you that are actors and other mediums, and you may have never been on stage yet, if you get a chance to, if you want the true love of the craft, you have to do a role like that that gets under your skin so completely it's hard to shake off. That's actually a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It means that you're alive. It's a lie. Lie. <laughs> so, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring up another question about a particular series. Um, I don't think too many people talk about neither because, like I said, everybody talks about these big roles and other things, but they don't look well, at the other ones that you've done. Uh, big roles, small roles, medium roles, any role that gets uh, gets you paid and gets you paid into the system, so you continue to get residuals is a good role. <laughs> Oh no, and I'm not, and I'm not meaning it in a bad way, saying like it's not a, a, a big. I get what you're saying. <laughs> I don't need to know. There's no, there's no pecking order. I'm proud that I've gotten so many credits. You know. Wasn't, wasn't oh yeah, easy. definitely. But the one I want to actually talk about um a little bit, you can actually explain it to him because I'm pretty sure we got people in here that has not seen the particular one I'm gonna talk about. Um, the Black Fo the Black Fox franchise. Could you tell us about that? Well, The Black Fox, which is based on a true story about Britt Johnson, who was the first federal marshal in, in the United States circa 1864. Um, I got a call out of the blue. Christopher Reeve, the late, great Christopher Reeve, was my co-star. We played Blood Brothers, even though we weren't. Um, not only was I working on in Calgary, shooting for Texas for eight months, and like makeshift, we would, one day it would be empty fields, next day it would be a village, a town popped up. You know, wearing a duster, riding a horse, carrying a shotgun, two pistols, and a big hat, and a bandana. But it, Westerns was my aunt. I keep going back to my aunt because she's my life force. That was her favorite medium of all. We used to watch movies at eight o'clock every night, and she would use those morality tales. Hey, okay? whether it would be White Heat or Sunset Boulevard, she'd find a way to teach me a lesson. So she had never been on a plane before, and I flew her first class to Calgary so that she could witness. And she got off the plane, she wanted to curse me, but she never, I could tell she wanted to curse because she acted like something was stuck in her throat. <laughs> the next crew made her a special seat, a lawn chair and a special blanket. And every time I looked over, when I was riding a horse to a stagecoach or jumping from one cliff to the other, she had the biggest, loveliest grin on her face. And uh, that was the moment that we both knew I was gonna be okay. And, and uh and i was going to take care of her from that moment on nice nice oh man so um black fox is in three parts you know it's three we and originally it was going to be it was going to be a series of cbs I mean, west mundez sent us uh he was the former president at the time uh these lovely baskets and stuff and then we took a break and that was when chris unfortunately had his accident so never came to pass but those three movies we did make do exist and uh, it's one of the first movies I tell, particularly African American kids, because I want them to know that um, you know we spent a long time thinking that you know there weren't any black cowboys. We know that Buffalo soldiers do exist. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So let's take it off of movies for a second, yeah. and and let's and let's talk about us as artists. So as an artist myself, I know one of the biggest things that end up coming forth this year was the fact that you have so many things and events, speaking engagements and everything, cons lined up to participate in, and all of a sudden COVID-19 shows its ugly face. Right. And then for the artists and all the workers, yeah. uh, we end up getting put out of we end up getting put out of work. I know myself, I can speak on myself. Mm -hmm. I end up losing about um and I don't mind sharing the number, I end up losing about um at least twelve thousand dollars in revenue because of all the gigs I had lined up that I was gonna do. And I know more. There's been more um, artists and other people that's been affected, especially musicians, actors that may have to go to sets but can't really act on their sets a little bit. Um, then you got the restaurants, you got the the workers that's out there doing their job, and then you got other people that's basically had to file for unemployment. So my question for you, as artist to artist, um, how do you feel 
COVID-19 has affected the entertainment business along with restaurants and tourism. And what do you feel the lasting effects will um, be from this? Uh, I, I think that things are going to change and that is never going to be the same again. I know SAG, Screen Actors Guild, is imposing new safety guidelines that uh, may mean the end of all independent films. When I say independent, I mean a film that has a budget of 200 or less because the new guidelines require at least $60,000 to implement. And a lot of people who make their first film, you know, they come to the dance with just that production and then they hire whatever they can get off of Craigslist. Those days are gonna end. Um, I have a lot of friends in New York who are Broadway members that had popular shows, a lot of jazz musician friends who don't have a gig right now. Um, you know, the restaurant industry has lost 25% of, 25% uh, probably won't be able to come back. Um, and that is all related and intertwined with the tourism trade, with the acting trade, with all the orchestra people, all the ballet dancers that are out of business. And, uh, and I heard that Broadway won't come back until uh, next January. So it would be interesting to see what life is like without continual culture. Um, whatever happens, and I have faith. I'm not. A, I'm not. An, I'm not a pessimist. What I think everything happens for a reason, and uh, whatever strength that people can pull out of this time, they need to hold on to that. Uh, because whether it's this pandemic or another one, or another one after that, you have to be prepared, and you got to know what's important to love in this life. Definitely. Um, I know like with us here, as far as um, stuff that I'm got my hands on, our festival, we had to postpone our festival till September. But now we're in the process of seeing what we're going to do with that, because of the guidelines we have here, you can't have no more than like 50 people at a certain time in a venue. So right. now we have to figure out how we're going to manage things as far as that. And then even with our own events that we do on a regular, we have to worry about the numbers and everything of that nature, artists that one that normally would come here. So like now we're, we've been doing stuff a little bit virtually. Our one show we do virtually and it's still, it's still fun. But the thing is, it's not the same. I think with uh, oh. artists in general, you just, you just miss that energy of people being around because you feed off of it a little bit. And I mean, Absolutely. this is a good, it, yeah, like, and this is a good interim, but it's never the same. Actor and audience, otherwise you're just doing it for yourself. I mean, it doesn't love bringing. And I'm a sports guy, you know. I miss my Lakers, but the way they may have to come back with like two tent cities, Orlando and Vegas, and keeping uh, athletes in Vegas and quarantine them in beautiful suites. I don't know how that's going to work, but uh, you know. Uh, but they're talking about playing games in empty stadiums, uh, so we'll see. And we know that. You know, it's nothing like a big play and getting that energy from the crowd. That be yeah. Them. So we'll see. It's, 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 yeah, we're, we're work, I'm working through it. <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you. It's, it's, well, but you it's, know what? It's, challenge. We have been presented a challenge. And we can either toss in the towel and give up, or we can force ourselves. I mean, you shouldn't have to force yourself, but become kinder, gentler, more humane people to each other and cut through all this racial tension that is suddenly surging. Um, you know, it takes all the United States of America, not the divided states. Nice. I, I love that. <laughs> so you also not only do theater, not only do you play in um, roles on the, the, the big screen and the small screen, but you also do voice acting. You have done voice acting for one of my favorite DC characters as a villain, <laughs> and in a recent um, movie, I know, just <laughs> I, I'm just saying I don't I don't want to put the business out there too much. But I'm gonna let you talk about it. Um, tell us about um, your your ventures as far as with voice acting and some of the things that people may not know that you were in that well, you are in. Yeah, well, you know, voiceover is one of the hardest mediums to break into in the entertainment thing because it's so competitive and everybody wants to do it because as we've learned during this time, we've been able to, voiceover has been keeping me uh, active and alive um, and uh, functional, which is great. You know, I had to set up my own voiceover booth here and uh, and we've been doing that. Uh, currently out is Dark Side, uh, which I love. And DC's been good to me. I did Zoom for them. That 
there's an audition on my desk uh, for a, uh, they're doing a new Superman series. So uh, they want me to consider, uh, and it ain't Jimmy Olsen and it ain't Lois Lane. <laughs> Who would it be? That's it. You know, that's the mind, okay? <laughs> I was just saying. I was just saying. But but you also but you've also done video games too, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, right now we got Alex Half Life that's out. Uh, you know, we did Call of Duty Black Ops too, and we got a couple in the can that I can't talk about. But uh, we also have a. I'm voicing a. I can say this. I'm voicing a wonderful dragon for. Uh, anime series is going to drop on Netflix soon. Um, his name is Slyrak. He's a huge, huge dragon, but 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 a compassionate dragon, but don't mess with him. <laughs> I'm going to be looking for it because I, I, I love anime tremendously. Anime, people be sleeping on anime, but they have some of the best stories. If you pick oh. the right ones, some of the stories are great on it. The um, that particular piece has taken two years to work to develop. Uh, it's beautiful. So if you're into that kind of thing, uh, I'm not the lead of it, but I'm in every episode. And I think we already got 24 of them shot. More nice. Than- so I'm going to show you some comments real quick. Um, somebody was saying that they didn't know that. Didn't know what? <laughs> um, I think it's all about your, your role with Dark Side and um, Justice League. Okay. Um, also, you have somebody bring up. Thank you. They loved, work- <laughs> um, they loved your work with Dark Side. By the way, the two I just put up, they're, they're the friends. We they're friends that we um ate with when you were here. Um, oh. we went out to eat. Um, and then somebody put up this. We had one more person say this about you, and it's probably gonna be a segue in a second. You are such an incredible actor. You're part of the reason they don't watch scary movies or why they ride behind trucks transporting logs. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, the new Candyman drops September 25th, uh, 2020, and it's a movie that is not to be missed. So, begs the question. So, a lot of people are wanting to know, do you have any type of involvement with that movie, whether it be starring, creative consulting, or anything of that nature? Uh, you know, uh, you know, my lips are tied, man. But uh, I mean, clearly, do I look like I'm depressed? <laughs> so, <laughs> September twenty fifth, twenty twenty, and the world will know. Got you. Yeah. So, and not talking about the not talking relationship. about the one. I'm sorry. Go ahead. We have a good relationship with Monkey Paw, which is Jordan Peele's producing company. Nice. And so also- not talking. Important because Nikki DeCosta, uh, a, a young, vibrant black woman who I believe is 27, is helming this film, which is a rarity. And you were right about that. Chicago. Okay, so respect to Nikki, you know? Nikki. Yeah, definitely. And it's glad, I'm glad you said that because I'm um, not talking about the um, new Candyman at the moment. Let's talk about the old Candyman because the, um, the reason I showed that clip at the beginning is because of something that you said importantly you don't want people to know you strictly for that role because it's part of a package of everybody knowing tony todd yeah but, um i'm sorry go ahead no yeah there was one reason you know cons for me is a double-edged sword i mean i like meeting people and going there but at the same time i i, I have to hear like you know 300 candy man questions and, and and my body of work is is I don't want to say beyond Candyman, it includes Candyman. And uh, I always try to use the opportunity to, to, to bring people up to speed, you know? I mean, I'm not a personality driven actor, so, and I don't use a publicist, so um, you won't see me in the centerfold of People Magazine or, you know, whatever those gossip magazines are, I look a bit life. Um, and sometimes I heard a publicist say, well, we, we need, a, you got to have a little dirt that gets people interested. No, you don't. I, I shower every day. I'm good. <laughs> That's a quotable. You ought to put that on a t-shirt. <laughs> well, I am working on my autobiography at the moment. That's what I also have been doing during this time. Nice, nice. I don't yet. So, but, uh, so with the um, just go back to the Candyman movie. Um, you you talk so much about it, and I I want you to. I hate to like make you go back to this particular interview that I had planned in the beginning, but you said something that stood out so much, and I felt it was more of 
you saying it so that way people get to know the history about certain things you was talking about um and i'm and i'm paraphrasing how Capri, how uh, cabrini green because not there but it was something like special about it. it i can't remember the word you used for it i'm trying to think of that word it was it was something you called it but can you tell us about just the the fact of being in that environment and how yeah. that may have helped elevate that character as far as how you wanted to portray it being in that environment was very close to the environment I was raised in. Like I said, I was surrounded by like five to 6,000 projects and I had friends in all of them. Matter of fact, at first, uh, when my aunt rescued me and uh, decided to raise me, I had to also be co-parented by her mother, my grandmother's grandma, Susie. And she lived in Charlie Oak Paris, okay? Uh, so it wasn't that foreign an experience to me. In my mind, in my educated mind, you know, housing projects are like uh, indentured prisons. Uh, they put people in a situation where, like Claudine, the movie, uh, they can't have a man present, or if they do have a man, it lowers their, their uh, adjustable income thing. And, you know, when you have a, a child, you know, household over five, one of those kids is going to go out in the street find a way to survive and make money and, and provide. It's a, it's, a, it's a breeding ground for this opportunity. And, um, you know, you, you got to figure a way how to, if you are in a housing situation, sometimes you can't control that, to always dream, you know, watch the things that make you inspired, be, find the magic inside so that you can somehow escape that so that when you are successful, you're still going to remember that, but you're going to remember it in a different way. And thank God that you aren't suppressed by that environment anymore. Got you. <clears throat> Excuse me. So another franchise that I loved you in, Final Destination. Final Destination, I feel that you were more so the character that really the movie centered around and like to me like even with the last one they did which is supposed to be like before the first one i think it was final destination five like right. the way the movie ended when they kind of recapped everything and they showed you like walking off with like a smile on your face hmm. like i felt like throughout the whole series except for i think the final destination which i think that was the one that you weren't in to deal with the racetrack right. um you had a, a role in that movie that i wish that if they made another one, which I hear they're kind of in the talks of making another one, that role would have got expanded. But how do you, so tell me your thoughts on that particular character as far as like the, I guess the, the light of day between that character and Candyman's character. Um, well, I was honored to be in another franchise, you know, I'd obviously made money. Um, to be honest, I felt guilty when I first did the first one, because we shot all those in Vancouver and they would fly me up and put me in this beautiful suite and i would be on set no more than three days and then i fly back while the kids had to carry the movie and uh you know end up working two to three months and uh most of them were uh newer actors and uh, loved you know just being in a movie um jeffrey reddick who created the storyline a good friend of mine um you know originally it had been a pilot or a show presentation of X-Files. And they put a pin on it, James Wong and Glenn, and they sent it to 20th Century and they found a way to make a movie. I was happy, I heard, oh, I wasn't the first choice for that role. I don't know who else it would have been. <coughs> Sam, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I'm not sure about that, but anyway, I ended up doing it. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and, and a very good reason to also thank you for that. <laughs> so we got a few more minutes. Um, I do want to say Bye. that. Say that one more time. Flying by. I know, right? It don't even seem like we've been on here for almost an hour. Um, you do have other projects that you do have um, in the tank or getting ready to come out. Can you go ahead and let everybody know? What they could be expecting. Yeah. I know you mentioned um, the anime on Netflix with the dragon, right. but I know you have other projects as well. Yeah, we got like six films in the can uh, coming up in the next quarter, meaning before the end of the year. Uh, Immortal, which is something I'm passionately uh, uh, involved in. I'm also a producer on that. And uh, some marvelous quartet of 
proposition, propositional films um, suggesting what would happen if, if one lived forever. Um, and uh, I'm very, very proud of my work on that. It reminded me very much of the Visitor episode I did for Deep Space Nine. We also have a great film based on a true story called All Gone Wrong that I shot in St. Louis about an infamous underground figure named Lamont Hughes. And he ran this drug empire. The thing that made him special, A, he was never arrested, and B, he ran it like a, he, he, he preferred sweaters and, uh, you know, he had a pet iguana that he loved more than people. And, uh, but if you cross them, don't make him put on his jacket and get in his white Mercedes and confine you. Because if he comes out of his, anyway, it's based on a true story about cop corruption intertwining the underworld and how come drugs show up miraculously in every ghetto city all across America every single day. Uh, those are two. Uh, Martha, Texas, or Martha the movie now, I think, uh, is a pretty, there's a phenomenon in Texas called Martha Lights. Uh, they're just operational lights that appear in the sky. Some people think they're spirits. Uh, the natives think they're deceased angels. But whatever, if you get caught up in that zone, your life can change forever. So I played the mayor of that town. Proud of that. Nice. Those are three that are coming right on top of each other. All right. So I, I kind of want to ask this question, but I don't know if yeah. I can ask this Very, question. But I'm you know, the thing about me as a character, actor, I can't both. Okay. Tony, you still there? Like your phone's breaking Hello? up a little bit. Do we cut yeah. out? No, no, can you hear me? Hello? Can you hear me? Here. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, I think you kind of went can out. Can you hear me? Bit. Yes, I can hear you. Me? Yeah, can you hear me, Tony? Can you hear me? Yes, I can I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, got you. Um repeat what you just said. Yes, I can. Okay, repeat what you just said. Um you were saying something before it went okay. out. I don't know what I said. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, man. A moment to moment. I don't remember. Ah, oh, that was priceless. So Thank I you. have a question I want to ask you. Hey. First of all, I was a day behind. I woke up today thinking it was Thursday, and then I realized my cats told me it was Friday. <laughs> so <it's okay. laughs> oh, I got to give one shout out to my one of my favorite directors I ever worked with, Bernard Rose, yes. who did the original Candyman. He and I have been friends for years. Uh, we also did Frankenstein together, and I think he and I are going to come up with a big surprise for people once this is over and once the truth can be told and uh seriously trust me i wish i could say more but he it made me swear to not oh, no you're fine you're fine i i i, I want to be surprised by it i do have a question yeah. about one particular thing though so i um i don't know if i can access but i'm gonna try to tap dance around it so um back in the day back in the day there is um artist um who made I think one of the most underrated movies um, that when it, it that comes to like horror a little bit, but more so the message. And the name of the movie was called Tales from the Hood, um, mm -hmm. which the first one literally I feel goes so underrated because it, if you look at that movie now, it literally yeah. translates to a lot of the stuff that's happening right now. Um, still, thank you. Um, because I yeah, forgot. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah. Um, so then you got rest. Then you got part two that came out, and um, Keith David it took on a role that Clarence Williams the third had played in um, as that particular character. Um, but now there's a third one that's um, working on that's coming out, and um, on Rusty Candy's um, Instagram, I saw a picture of you on there. So is, <laughs> is, is he it, about casting me? I don't know. I was gonna ask. Is it is it possible that you may be in the works doing a Tales from the Hood three? Yeah, that's public. I can say public knowledge, and I was very happy being asked to join that uh, the honorable franchise. You know, I've been on a lot of franchises, which is very damn cool. Um, yeah, I'm very this wonderful actor, Sage. Uh, beautiful discovery. Her, it was basically we do all the wraparound stories in this. It's four stories. But we have a half hour segment of wraparounds with our journey. 
and marvelous young actor. I can look at her eyes and see nothing but truth, humility, passion, and expectation, which is all you need from your acting partner. So yes, Tales in the Hood 3. I think that drops, uh, I want to say, the second week of October. So so y'all heard it here first, expect it? I'm an, I've been very busy, but I'm always busy. It's just this little dead period that I'm going to have to do some explaining to do. But, uh, <laughs> but the boys so, are that. Yeah, so real quick before we wrap this show up, um, if anybody got any questions, this is the time where you need to do it now. Ask your questions because if you don't have any questions, this will be us wrapping up the show and just two friends you. talking right now while y'all are getting y'all questions together. I want to Man. thank you that did tune in, you know, heart to art, art to heart. Um, we appreciate it. And I'm sure, EL, you're going to be posting this on our, our other mediums, right? It's actually, um, so like right now it's on Facebook, but it's actually being streamed on YouTube as well. So it'll be saved on YouTube and I can send you the link once, yeah. once it's done. So yeah. it's going to be recorded. Yeah. On okay, you should do that, you know, because I told you before, I don't do Facebook. Oh yeah, that's why I tell. That's why I was telling you. Like the platform I use is just it's synced to like multiple other sites, so it's really not on Facebook. It just gets streamed to Facebook and everywhere else I put it. So you're good. Okay. I know. But, uh, I'm just telling you, but you know when you you know what mediums. <laughs> are, so I would love to get you a bigger, right? Oh yeah. But definitely. I want to thank everybody that did to us in real time. We appreciate the time you took out of your busy day. Yeah, I'm trying to show you all the comments that people are sending you right now because they're they're sending a lot of comments in right now. Thank you. Yeah, people awesome. enjoy you, Tony. Like they they got to see a side of you that nobody knows about. <laughs> I enjoy people. I miss everybody. I miss seeing people in the face. Okay. Wow. <laughs> Tony, keep I being nothing here but my cats. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, one person, um, another person from when you came here last time said they enjoyed meeting you um when you came here. Looking forward to seeing your upcoming project and the autobiography. The autobiography is gonna be uh, a revelation. And if so, I just touch one kid living in the hood somewhere that doesn't know what's gonna happen to him, if I can touch one kid and inspire him, that's the price of the mission. Yeah, like I'm laughing at all these people that's commenting right now. <laughs> so I've been posting it up here, but if anybody wanted to follow you in your social medias, where can they follow you at? Yeah, uh, well, on Instagram uh, at Tony Todd Official and Twitter at Tony Todd Fifty Four. Okay, I'm very active on Twitter and Instagram. There it is. There it is. Okay, ladies. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, um, y'all are. Okay. Go ahead, brother. I'm sorry. Um, you go. Phone number is 877 62 96 change. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. That's a wrap. Oh, man. Tony, Tony, Todd, and Tony. I, I'm, I'm, I'll I'm, see you I'm, yeah, man. That's, what I'm That's what I'm about to tell you, brother. Um, I miss you tremendously. Um, we will definitely get back your way soon and go to Apple Pan. I definitely need to get you back here soon so you can mm -hmm. actually have some uh, mm -hmm. Carolina barbecue. Still there, Tony? Yeah. All right. I got a I got a beef brisket that's marinating in my fridge right now. Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, I, I can hear you. Can you hear me? All right, brother. You, can you yeah, hear me? Still? I don't want to say goodbye about signing off, but man, it sounds like we're disconnected. Yeah, it's it's fine. Hello? If you gotta go, if you gotta go, Tony, that's fine. I get it because of, it's, it's, I think it's bad signal because of the weather on right. my end. Okay, well, stay safe and dry, man. Thank you for this, and I, I look forward to sharing the feed. All right. Oh no problem. I'm gonna hit you up. I'm gonna hit you up after this is done. <laughs> okay. Thank you, brother. God bless everybody. All right. Take care, Tony. Stay. God bless. bless. All right, everybody. So that is our first official show of Art to Heart. I pray that y'all enjoyed this. If you have any questions, feel free to look back at this feed on Facebook. Or if you want, you can go to YouTube and you can type in LJ Bowens or you can type in Art to Heart featuring Tony Todd. 
and this video will pop up if y'all want to try to backtrack all the stuff we had. I know mad people sent a lot of questions, but I, it was on multiple sites and I could not get to all this, all the um, places to get all the questions that I need to pull from there. So I apologize. It'll be stuff that we'll work on. But I do want to let y'all know that with Art to Heart is not only going to be just actors, it's going to be poets, it's going to be singers, it's going to be um, local community leaders, it's going to be community leaders across the country. It's going to be a lot of people um, going to be on here getting interviewed. I have a lot of people already that I have plan to be on this show that i've reached out to so it's just setting the date and we're looking to probably do this probably going to be every third friday from here on out so just be ready for the next person um like i said um it's gonna be dope like we got a lot of people lined up like i said award-winning artists people that's doing great things in the community and abroad so um tony ty is just a great friend and we've been talking about doing some stuff for a long time anyway but this is just the, the quickest way to get this done. But we actually got some more stuff in the works that I cannot tell y'all about yet. So y'all just have to wait and see when it comes up. So other than that, guys, I want to thank y'all once again so much. If you want to follow me on anywhere else but Facebook, then you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at LJ Poetry. Once again, Twitter and Instagram at ELJA Poetry. Thank y'all so much. It is still early, so make sure y'all get out there and do some good stuff. Um, in the community, I hope y'all are being safe. You don't know if you should watch your high right now. Oh man, go ahead and <laughs> you're good. You're good. Have fun with it. <laughs> so thank you guys so much. And like I always say, um, remember purpose of popularity, guys. Take care, and I will see y'all soon because we got um Art Meets Life, the actual Art Meets Life show coming up very soon on June fifth. So take care, guys, and be safe. Peace. <laughs> You're going to hear me sing till I cut this off. And I'm out. Peace.